joining me at the September edition of At the Table, where the 2024 presidential race is already in full swing, is Franklin Four, the Atlantic Magazine writer who is the author of the new book, The Last Politician, Inside Joe Biden's White House and the Struggle for America's Future. Uh, Franklin, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. So we're talking as a lot of things are going on in, in Biden world of which you put yourself in in your book where you covered uh, the Biden presidency from inauguration day until the midterms in 2022. And you cover a lot of area, but let me start with something that is in the news right now. And that's Biden's age. You know, you you wrote in the book about how uh, his age, that he is the oldest president in history. Uh, you don't think gerontocracy is necessarily bad, but uh, here's what he's up against, just in the lead from a Washington Post article of a few days ago. A growing number of polls are showing voters concerned about President Biden's age and energy. So as someone who knows him, who, who so much puts in the book what a man of his age and substance can do, can't do, uh, how do you put in context this debate about Biden's age? And by the way, what does he think of it? Yeah, so... Um... Since my book came out, I, it kind of was introduced in the middle of the whirlwind that you just described, where there's a great deal of panic among Democrats, I think, not necessarily elite establishment Democrats, but out there. And it's clear that there are a lot of people in the country who've got an issue with his age. And so I've, as I break down the issues, um, I look at it from a couple of different perspectives. There's one, there's kind of the objective question, like, do we want to have an 86-year-old president? And I know my preference would be probably not to have one um, uh, because there's a lot of risk that comes with that. The second question is kind of what's he like right now? And because that's all we can judge him on. I mean, he, people age in very, very different sort of ways. I mean, Mitch McConnell has his own issues with aging, which have nothing to do with his numeric age, but have a lot to do with health conditions and issues that he's had over time. Diane Feinstein has her own issues. But Joe Biden right now, if you were to offer him a mental acuity test, which is what Nikki Haley has suggested that he take, I, I'm pretty sure he would he would ace it. Like he's he may not have the energy to go out and run a political campaign in the way that he did when he was 60 or 40. But he does have the ability to think through an issue like, you know, supporting the Ukrainian counteroffensive or trying to avert a government shutdown. But the problem is, is that uh, people don't look at this in an objective sort of way. They Everybody brings their own issues with aging to bear on this topic because... We all have parents. We all have grandparents. We've all dealt with issues like this before, and we project what we know onto the president of, of the United States. And I think the biggest issue for him politically is that there's no way out of this. Like, There's no way for him to convince people that he's actually young and spry. Or if people have this strong preference for a younger president on aesthetic grounds or whatever, it it. it he's just not going to be able to dissuade them from their position. And so his ultimate view is that it's elections are binaries. It's either me or the other guy. And whatever the flaws of his aging uh, come with his aging, they're very different than everything that Donald Trump <laughs> brings into that campaign. And I'll just say one other thing. I do think that there's a way in which the media treats this issue to me in a way that's mildly irresponsible where it sometimes seems as if whatever Biden's inability to complete a sentence at times or the ways in which he trails off or he gets lost in a story, somehow that's now on a continuum with Donald Trump and all the, the you know, all of the erratic things that we see Donald Trump do. Well, I thought it was unfair when he said at a press conference uh, in a different time zone where it was nine o'clock at night, but in the daytime in, in America, he said, and I thought this was just a wisecrack uh, when he was winding up, I'm going to bed. Yeah. Because I knew it was night where he was. And uh, this, this, I know reporters went on the trip, they're exhausted. Everyone's tired. It's the end of a long day. 
uh, is is this though where he he's not thinking of the right ways to minimize his age in the sense that he, he makes self-deprecating jokes sometimes? Uh, is he handling his age the right way? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think that he he has to lean into it because it's obvious. You know, it, it, you don't need to be Bob Woodward to see that he's he's old. Um, and also, I think that there's actual strength that comes from being an experienced leader. And if he found some sort of way to lean into his age and to demonstrate that, you know, there's certain things that he's been able to get done in very difficult circumstances that it took a lifetime of learning to be able to navigate. That's actually a virtue. It may not compel people to affirmatively vote for him, but it could maybe take some of the edge off of the issue. Mm -hmm. That's a point. I want to turn, we're going to jump around a little bit in this conversation, yeah. Franklin. This is not a perfectly structured where I go one, two, three. I'm going from one to four right now because I want to turn to foreign policy for a moment because we're speaking the day before uh, Ukrainian uh, President Zelensky comes to Washington, D.C. We're speaking as he's in New York for the United Nations General Assembly. So the war in Ukraine is going on for more than a year. And foreign policy is Joe Biden's specialty. Chairman of yes. the Foreign Relations Committee, he's traveled everywhere. He's, he's been in Ukraine many times. And he was questioning uh, Zelensky that, uh, and Zelensky was questioning Biden. Zelensky, uh, you write, told aides that he thought Biden was uh, weak. And Biden, this is at the my opinion yeah. of him. Yeah. So yeah. where are we? So the, if you could set the stage of then and now, because right now, for our listeners, they're going to be hearing in the coming weeks debates about giving more aid to Ukraine, the process of the war. Uh, within the Republican presidential primary, there's debate about support. Republicans are split. Could you kind of set the stage in Ukraine where yeah. Biden was and where we're at now? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is um it's one of the arcs, narrative arcs of my book is that Biden and Zelensky begin their uh shared journey um long before the Ukraine war starts. And you gotta remember that Zelensky was very traumatized by the whole Trump impeachment scandal and the way in which Hunter Biden's business dealings in Ukraine suddenly became the basis for Trump trying to blackmail him. And so there was a lot of resentment on Zelensky's part. And also he didn't really understand how to navigate Washington in normal times. He could only think about Trump times. And Biden had been involved in Ukrainian politics far longer than Zelensky. Biden <laughs> Biden had the portfolio, Ukrainian portfolio in the Obama administration. And so they, the first meeting, you have this guy who was a rookie. He was a former um, comedian who's just getting into politics. You have Biden who thinks he's like the as you suggested there's no he's he's an, he's he's an expert on foreign policy especially in his own mind and so um he doesn't really think that much of zelensky's initial tactics but over time they develop a relationship not um not a perfect friend to friend relationship but much more of a mentor protege relationship but but one where there's some tension because Zelensky always wants more because that's his job as president of Ukraine who's fighting for his nation's survival. He needs every arm um, system available. He needs every fighter jet he can get his hands on. Biden, um, as the leader of the Western alliance, wants to give him most of that. But I think he both as a psychological matter resents the idea that Zelensky is oftentimes talking over his head to Western publics in order to apply pressure on him. And so Biden feels like he doesn't ever get enough credit for everything he's done for Ukraine. But then there's also just this very practical matter that Biden's a child of the Cold War. He remembers uh, having to hide under his desk in drills. And and I'd ask his aides in every meeting, I was like, what what question does Biden ask about Ukraine when he's in meetings? And he asks, well, if I give the Ukrainians this weapon system, will it result in escalation? How will Russia react? And as personally, as somebody who's a Ukraine hawk, I wish Biden sometimes would go further. Yeah. But as a citizen of the world, I'm kind of 
grateful that Biden is concerned about the prospects of nuclear war and um, is at least responding, you know, rationally thinking strategically about things. So I think that there's much less of that tension now than there was at the beginning of their relationship, but it's still there. So where does it go given in these next few weeks when Biden presumably will go to bat for the uh, supplemental approach, but it will be involved in presidential politics. Uh, is this something that helps? Is it, I mean, how does he handle it in the context that we are in a campaign season? Yeah, so I think that um, just given where the Republican Party has been at on foreign policy writ large, which is this American first idea that Donald Trump taps into, um, I think that Republican elites, I think if it were up to McCarthy and McConnell, they would fund the war. But McCarthy is in this perilous position where he's relying on a couple of very, very right wing Republicans who are deeply isolationist, don't like the war, and he's stuck. And so I don't know if there's any way around this ultimately. I mean, I, I think that um, McCarthy cares more about his own speakership than he does the Ukrainian war. And so he's not going to sacrifice his uh, speakership to build a bipartisan coalition, in my opinion, with the Democrats in order to um, get the Ukrainians what they need in order to sustain their effort. So as, as Biden progresses, and speaking of Congress right now, let me just pivot. You write a lot about one of the most interesting set of almost trilateral relations hmm. in Congress. You yeah. know who I'm talking about, but I'll tell everybody. Uh, it's this whole drama that you you deeply dive into between Joe Biden and Arizona, now independent Senator Kristen Sinema, and West Virginia Democrat Joe Biden. Sinema aligns with the Democratic caucus, so she's one of the majority, 51, before the midterm. She was any one of those two could, they, they were uh, like their own little presidents because they had the power to stop yes. or pass a bill. Now with, there's a little more uh, breathing area for the Democrats, but not then. But you write so much about the, the care and feeding of Joe Manchin and trying to get in his head. And essentially at first you would think, well, these are two guys that burnish their blue collar uh, man of the people image, but yet Biden had difficulty. Uh, who do you think was easier in the end for Biden to deal with, a uh, mansion or a cinema? All right. So it's uh, what you're describing is this fascinating psychodrama where uh, Biden also is somebody who was um, a creature of the Senate, uh, somebody who called himself a Senate man when he retired from the Senate felt like he could conduct these highly personal negotiations in a very one-on-one -on -one -one sort of way with both Manchin and Cinema. And for a time, it felt like Cinema was the harder one to deal with because there were moments where she, I, I have a moment in my book where she threatens to walk out of a meeting and oh, then right, stops her returning. She revealed the number for uh, 1.1 trillion. She had some yes. number for, what was the bill? It was- yeah. It's for the Build Back Better bill yes. that Biden wanted to know what people's bottom lines were. And he got stuck in this moment where he was meeting with a bunch of moderates and nobody wanted to say what their bottom line was. And so it was kind of silent. And then he Biden decided he would fill in the void because Biden doesn't like an uncomfortable silence. And he said, oh, uh, Kirsten, your bottom line is one point one trillion. And she responds by saying, I thought that I gave that to you in private. And um, she then threatens the rest of the room, like, if this leaks, I'll know where it comes from. And then tells Biden, like, you know, if I'm not going to negotiate up to like spending a trillion in an infinite amount of money, then I guess there's no point in my being here. And she starts to leave. And then Biden has to pull her back this into the room. This is a meeting with the president in the Oval Office, and they're treating him in a sense as if he were just another senator. But is that yeah. because he didn't, he didn't see himself in these contexts as the president or is it is it just not it was his comfort zone to kind of revert as a senate leader instead 
I mean, what, what was, what, what? I think he, 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 he views himself as a negotiator and a yeah. deal maker. And he felt like he was the person who had the expertise to do this. And he also thought that I think the prestige of the presidency and doing this in the Oval Office might be the thing that carries him over the line. Because look, he was going for something so ambitious. I mean, he was trying to get the biggest expansion of the social safety net since Lyndon Johnson with a one vote margin in the Senate. It's, it's, it's borderline insane what he set out to do. And I think absent Afghanistan and the collapse of his approval numbers, he might very well have gotten there. The, so the two problems were just with cinema. So cinema, um, it looked like she, she was so unresponsive, but in the end she played ball mansion. Um, I think has less ideological commitment to the Biden agenda. And so he, he would, he, but he's a heck of a nice guy. And so he would keep telling Biden that he wanted to get a deal done, but then kept sabotaging the deal because in his heart of hearts, he didn't want to get the deal done. And so he ultimately was the hard, hard one to pin down. Well, you write about at about page 231, uh, a real insider account about Nancy Pelosi, then the House Speaker and Biden. They're talking about build back better. And let me take a pause because for our listeners, there are this is the the building block of the Biden presidency. The three big successes are these mega bills: the American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Act, and the Chip Semiconductor Act. Build back better in a different form morphed into uh, the inflation reduction. Yeah, Inflation yeah. Reduction Act. Yes. So. Pelosi actually, or you report because somehow you know that Pelosi thinks that Biden whiffed in making the ask and in a sense didn't have, didn't know how to do it. Can you set this story up and tell us and how Pelosi had that kind of uh, very critical look at the president? Right. So, um, I mean, Pelosi, Pelosi at the end of October of 2021 started to get very desperate about passing legislation. She made a promise to the moderates in her own caucus that um, they would get a vote on the um, infrastructure bill by by the end of September, because um, in order to keep everything moving through the Congress, both Pelosi and Schumer just can keep doing whatever they whatever it takes to keep the process moving. The whole thing is a Rube Goldberg contraption where they have these multiple pieces of massive legislation moving through moderates and and progressives kind of at each other's throats completely distrustful and there was this day where at the end of october um, biden decides that he's going to come up to capitol hill and address the the house democrats and he comes into this big meeting room and pelosi had called him up the night before and she basically told him like you gotta ask them for their votes now you're about to leave for this major summit in um abroad meet with foreign leaders like you need climate commitments you need you need to show that this is happening otherwise your presidency is crumbling and so biden comes up and he's very jovial and he does um he does a, a very effective job of a, addressing the caucus but he gets to this moment where he needs to ask them explicitly for their votes and he fails to do it and uh pelosi was so frustrated with him and th there was this moment where the moderates in the caucus started chanting vote 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 and biden seemed to hold up two fingers to suggest that he didn't want them to vote on the one bill that nancy pelosi was asking for a vote on that one day but to ask for the both bills to be voted on simultaneously and Pel pelosi just you know she, she knows how to get things done and she she just couldn't fathom why biden wasn't approaching this but the same level of urgency that she was on it uh also pelosi had i think more of a pelosi seems more secure in her own skin in a sense and sometimes uh biden does partly because of the um i i say this partly because of biden's own self-deprecating Humor, uh, I, I rarely, if ever, can remember uh, Pelosi poking fun at herself in any way. But uh, can, I, can I just can I just can I just remind there was a story in the book where at the end of this meeting where Biden fails to ask uh, for a vote, there was um, 
uh, a young boy who was in the who happened to be in the room, and mm -hmm. Biden comes up to him and puts his arm around him and says, "You know, it's better to be speaker than president of the United States," which is, illustrates exactly what you're saying—that kind of self-deprecating behavior where he seems to be kind of taking a dig at his own lack of power in a way that Pelosi would not do. <laughs> but speaking of insecurities or securities, uh, you also delve into something I observed in covering uh, the Obama administration was how Joe Biden was treated by former President Obama and how this relates to how he treats the current Vice President Kamala Harris, who has her own problems and her own polling popularity and future. So you write uh, that Biden wanted to treat Harris with the respect that he felt Barack Obama had and accorded him. He made a point of referring to her as the vice president as opposed to my vice president. He was a stickler for asking her opinion in meetings and making sure that her office was kept in the loop. But while he treated her with impeccable respect, you write, he simply didn't hand her the substantive role that he played in the Obama administration. Partly because you conclude Biden didn't need Harris in the same way that Obama needed Biden. Can you talk about the relationship between the two? Yeah, so, I mean, what you're getting at is that Biden, um, Obama would roll his eyes at Biden because Biden's stories went on too long, because Biden, in Obama's, eye, in, in Obama's eyes, at least initially, was a bit of a cheese ball, and he practiced this kind of politics that Obama didn't especially um, respect or enjoy. I think over time, Obama came to respect the Biden approach to politics. Um, I was talking to John Favreau, who was the speech, Obama's speechwriter about this, and he said that Initially, they would include all these lines and speeches attacking Washington, attacking politics as usual, and that by the end of the administration, Obama would always cross out those lines. And he tells the speechwriters, look, you know, I have so much more respect for the, the likes of Harry Reid, Nancy Pelosi, and especially Joe Biden and their approach to politics um, and all the stuff that I was dismissive of at first. I now I now understand, um, essentially. Um, but so with Kamala, sorry. No, no, please. I, I was just going to say, I observed that covering Obama and the transition from the Senate to the White House. I I hope I wrote this at the time, something like, I don't think he thought much of the Senate in the beginning either. Yeah, uh, no, I'm but, sure you did write that. And <laughs> um, with Kamala Harris, uh, I mean, but, but with Obama, sorry, Obama fundamentally, though, needed Biden because uh, Biden had this expertise in certain areas of foreign policy, um, and also he had relationships on the Hill and an appetite for negotiating with Republicans on Capitol Hill that Obama simply didn't possess. Now, the problem with Joe Biden is that Joe Biden's been around so long, and Joe Biden considers himself a world's leading expert on pretty much everything <laughs> um, at the end of the day. There's really very little space for Kamala Harris to operate. And Kamala Harris hasn't made any of this easier on herself because she doesn't have a strong sense of her own political identity and she hasn't been sure what she wants her role to be in the presidency. I think some of this has been clarified over time, but initially, and this is almost, this is comical to me, she wanted the job of overseeing relations with Scandinavian countries, which is like, feels so beside the point that it's basically writing yourself out of the administration. And um, in the initial parts of the administration, because of COVID, um, Kamala Harris would basically shadow Joe Biden at meetings. She would go to every meeting that he went to, and she would ask very Biden-esque questions in those meetings. Everybody who was in those meetings would regard her as being a very sharp presence, like clearly somebody who's got um, uh, a, an incredible ability to pose a tough question and somebody who... Um, is always extremely prepared and on top of everything. But she was just following, she was she was with him attached to the hip, not carving out her own space. And I think it's only recently and maybe belatedly that she's begun to figure out who where she fits into the administration that um, Biden struggles to talk about the abortion issue. She's very, very good at talking about it. Um, initially, she was very con concerned about 
how she would appear to white working class men. And now I think she's much more comfortable um, being the administration's emissary to its base, which is, I think, a pretty sensible role for a vice president to have, and especially somebody, um, especially Kamala Harris to have. So things that, but, but, you know, it's almost too late in Washington's view where they have this very fixed opinion of her. Well, it is. And actually, as the more questions come up about Biden's age and the questions asked in the abstract about who would, what would happen if he stepped aside? I, I guess there's two scenarios that people are spinning. Uh, if he stepped aside, I, I think no, I, no one's really talking about him, him quitting, but if he stepped aside, and meaning not that he quits everyone, but that he says, I've decided not to seek a second term. The spotlight that is now on Harris is partly because people are trying to assess if that would happen or if, God forbid, God forbid for anyone who would get sick and something happened. Uh, do you think, by the way, that because of what you know about how uh, she is regarded within the Biden uh, team, and we all know from reports and polling on the outside, do you think she would be a front runner if for some reason he decided not to? I mean, I know she'd be a front runner. Everyone, let me say this again. <laughs> how would she fit in? Could he, he, is he in a position just to pass the baton to her cleanly or not? Um, well, I think part of the problem, you're talking about within a, a presidential primary, right? Well, if he said he's not running, and and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we could just have one you know, scenario after another, but if he decided to, to, to quit the race for a second term, then it would yeah. be open. But since in some states they're already starting, you know, I think yeah, in yeah. October 6th, you start passing your petitions for delegates. But, you know, how do you think it would play out? So I think that uh, I think Biden would probably pass the baton to her. This is just instinct. This is not reporting. But I think that Biden is somebody who, especially given everything we just talked about with his own vice presidency and his own personal scranton code where i think loyalty means something i think he would i think he'd want to be loyal to her and to pass the baton to her the problem is that 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 we would have for harris is that i don't know that biden biden standing within the democratic party is such that his imprimatur would mean all that much i think that if as soon as there was an open as soon as there was no longer an incumbent running in a democratic race, I think a lot of people would hop in very quickly. And oh. yeah. All bets are off. Before All we bets. leave on Obama, uh, Biden's the president, mainly at this point in time, because he was Obama's vice president. Uh, we talked a little bit about how uh, Biden, he had to evolve his own view of him. But you write in your book how uh, Biden gets a little frustrated with Chicago's very own David Axelrod. What's up with that, and how did that play out? Well, I just think it's uh, it's not just Axelrod. There are other uh, Obama uh, confidants that I think uh, Biden doesn't have. He still resents because he views them as being kind of people who were uh, part of the in crowd in the Obama administration and people who he knows would roll their eyes at him and and didn't. You know, I, I don't know. I think. Axelrod probably has a lot of respect for for Biden on like on one level, but he's just somebody who, you know, former journalist, a, a guy who um, is uh, is is uh, like is, is intellectual. I think that he brings out probably the worst in a lot of Biden's insecurities. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have another fascinating passage about Hillary Clinton. Mm. going rogue during the Biden presidency. We're talking about the evacuation of Afghanistan. It is a low point, maybe the low point in the Biden presidency. And she decides that she needs to just swing into action to save a group of women that were known as white scarves because they wore white, white scarves to find each other in, in that chaotic evacuation situation. Can, can you uh, share with us uh, Hillary Clinton going rogue and how the Biden team reacted to it? Yeah, so um, going back to the time that she was first lady, Hillary Clinton, um, especially after the healthcare debacle, 
she tried to find her place in the world and and human rights and women's rights was was the vehicle where she felt kind of rejuvenated and she felt like she could she had her own voice and she was very important in standing up against uh, the State Department, which wanted to recognize the Taliban in the Clinton administration. This goes on during the time that she's Secretary of State, and so she has real relationships with Afghan women. And as soon as Biden announces his plan to withdraw, she starts to get information, including a list that's faxed to her by a U.S. government employee with the names of 125 women who were likely to be assassinated by the Taliban. And so this makes her swing into action. And she goes to uh, the people she knows in the Obama administration, the Biden administration. And she says, look, I have this list of women. You need to do something. And she felt very frustrated by the fact that they weren't taking action to conduct humanitarian investigations, that they didn't seem to have a very good plan for protecting Afghan women. And so she began to conduct her own kind of rogue rogue operation is one way to put it. I mean, a shadow operation where she uh, she sets up her own network of safe houses in Kabul. Her NGOs hire security to get women to the airport. And then in the middle of the crisis, she begins calling foreign governments to find a home for these women. She calls the Ukrainians to ask for a plane that could fly the women out. And that really... Uh, infuriates Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, and he calls her up and tells her, you can't be doing this. And she shoots back, well, I wouldn't be doing it if you guys were. And um, I had come across um, Hillary's story as I was reporting about Afghanistan, because I would hear about uh, how in the Situation Room, her name would get invoked. And I heard from other people who were involved in humanitarian evacuations, how important she was. But she was very reluctant to, to tell her story about what she did for these Afghan women's because she didn't want to show up the administration. Mm -hmm. Why do you call Biden uh, in, in the title, the last politician? Well, we live in this age of anti-politics, uh, both Trump and Obama were people who posed as anti-politicians that they were people who who reveled in the fact that they came from outside, that politics itself was corrupt. And Biden is unmistakably somebody who is a politician. It's what he's been his whole life. His expertise is not the soaring oratory. It's not um, inspiring people, especially. It's all of these things that have fallen deeply out of fashion. It's the the horse trading, the nose counting. It's the the flattery. And his view of how he would save democracy from the threat of authoritarianism was that he needed to prove that politics could still work. Um, and, you know, my book is at once optimistic because it shows the ways in which politics can continue to get things done. But on the other hand, um, the last politician is not a very optimistic sounding title, at least from my perspective. Um, and I do think that there's, this sense in which all of these um, these techniques that Joe Biden has for getting things done just don't connect with voters and the anger that's out there and the rage that's out there. And, you know, his legacy hinges entirely on whatever happens in the 2024 elections. And if an authoritarian is elected in 2024, then, you know, <laughs> in some sense, we really have just seen the last politician. So his administration seems constantly trying to do events, mapping strategy to give Biden the credit they think he deserves. It is an ongoing theme that he never gets the credit. You reported and uh, how the three big acts, the Infrastructure Act, uh, American Rescue Plan, CHIP Semiconductor, uh, and some other things have made this, when you just look at history and, and you measure what you get done, he has accomplishments. Why is it so hard for him to get credit? Is it, is it what? Is it a poisonous political atmosphere? Is it the messengers? Is it the message? He does have, you, you might disagree now that this is an accomplishment, but it is something that he did. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to note that um, the sense of underestimation and the sense that he doesn't get credit is kind of key to his biography and his sense of self. 
so he he's always felt that about himself in the world um there's what uh the british call a sense of chippiness that he has there's like the the, the chip on his shoulder is immense um but I think there are a couple of things that are happening. One, like obviously you're correct that like the political times means that there are not very many people who can be, be persuaded of a president's accomplishments um, on the other side, but it, there's the, um, the looming fact of inflation, which is a very special type of economic pain. And even as inflation has receded, um, interest rates have kicked up. It's harder to get loans for things like economic, you know, economic indicators on some level look wonderful, but they're not really telling the full story about what it's like to live in the United States right now. Um, there's the fact that the base of the Democratic Party doesn't really love Biden, that what Biden's ended up passing are like, these pieces of legislation are very important. Progressives should love the climate legislation. But really, they're all at core fairly moderate accomplishments where he's not redistributing income. He's yeah. not expanding the social safety net. He's 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 reviving American manufacturing. He's protecting the country from national decline. Um, he's he's uh, overseeing a transition to green energy. That's all about stimulating batteries, electric vehicles, solar, wind, but does nothing to really punish the fossil fuel in industry. And so that moderation, I think, means that there's very little there that's viscerally resonating with the base of his party, which I think is a large reason why his approval ratings never seem to, to tick up. As we wind up, I want to talk about labor. Uh, former yeah. President Trump will be going to Detroit next week while other Republican primary candidates are debating at the Reagan Presidential Library. He's going to Detroit to talk to uh, striking workers there. Labor is seen in the Biden world as his thing. Uh, he has taken a side. Uh, Trump is trying to, I think, reframe the strike as a battle against electric cars. And I want to know, this is a union fight. You have to take a side. You, you know that song, which side are you on? Yes, yes. knows what side he's on. Uh, it will be interesting to see if Trump, how he dances on this one, if he takes a side. Uh, is, in, in your estimation, is the history that Biden has with labor meet the moment that we're in now? Or can Trump make inroads? I mean, Donald Trump was such a bad candidate in 2020 for all of these reasons, because of his handling of the pandemic, because um, he allowed his personal ire to take over. Um, he was waging a, um, like a, a vengeful campaign. We forget all of the strengths that he brought in 2016. And now we see the way that he's talking about abortion, where he's trying to moderate, and the way that he's trying to outflank Biden on the UAW strike. And you, you're reminded that he's actually got real political skill. And there was something there that he was able to channel very effectively, um, very shrewdly on some level, if not demagogically. Um, but Biden, um, Biden's, Biden's stuck a little bit on this issue because um, he's going, you know, Biden will have to take more of a side on this because with the railroad uh, strike and other labor negotiations, he's worried both about the national economic uh, state and the way in which a strike could cause short-term damage. And then he's tried to push labor's agenda. And those two things have always been in a little bit of tension. And um, it's very unusual for a president to, I don't know if there are any examples of a president walking a picket line. No, that, that but, would be something. Um, but when you talk about things hanging over Biden's head right now, uh, he, Maybe worried about the impeachment uh, moves by the Republicans in the House, Hunter Biden's indictment and serious legal problems, uh, the migrant crisis in America's cities, including Chicago and immigration overall at the border, uh, his age, the economy. And now, as we've been talking about, uh, whether labor sticks with him. Uh, of these issues, it seems to me the one that 
he seems most vulnerable, perhaps psychologically, is Hunter Biden, who he's kept close to him. Uh, how how does he process this? How does he handle his son being indicted? And I've I've read Hunter Biden's book. This this is somebody who has taken advantage of his family. Uh, did dang, you know? I I could kind of get being an addict, but the risks he took being the son of Joe Biden, it's just incomprehensible, you know, the risk he took to get drugs. Yeah, but, I mean, I just think that there's there's so many layers. It's, um, Joe Biden doesn't think about this politically or strategically even when he should. And as, as people have now reported amply, Biden has a hard time saying no to Hunter. And that's always been a core part of the problem. That's probably gotten a lot worse over time where after Bo's death, he's the only... You know, he's the only remember, remaining survivor of the car crash um, that uh, there's a lot of layers of guilt there because I think Hunter knows that um, that that Biden loved Bo most. I mean, it's pretty clear from the way that Biden talked about them. And I think Biden knows that Hunter knows that he loved Bo most. And so I think it's very, very fraught, very hard. And. Um, which is terrible because the Republicans are then, I mean, Hunter, Hunter deserves scrutiny. Hunter is a scuzzy guy and Republicans are picking at the open wound. They, they know that this is um, as a form of psychological warfare, there's nothing more destabilizing to Joe Biden you can do than to, to press against Hunter Biden. Um, and uh you know, I think that that Biden Biden doesn't really have a plan here, and and he would have been so much better off if he had insisted that um, Hunter, Hunter stick with Chris Clark, his first lawyer. He'd be much better off if he'd insisted that Hunter, going back to the very beginning, if Hunter had never got involved in, with Barisma to begin with, um, but he didn't do any of that. Joe Biden still then Franklin a work in progress. Yeah, so I think that it, you know everything turns on this election now. I mean, if 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 Biden loses this election, it taints his entire presidency. It proves his theory of the case was wrong. So, um, very much a work in progress. And with that last word, I want to thank Franklin Ford, the author of "The Last Politician Inside Joe Biden's White House." and the struggle for America's future. Franklin, thank you for joining us on this latest edition of At the Table. Thank you.